Right. Well, I think we should make a start. There are some people still coming in, but let's let's make a start. Um, so, a very warm welcome to everyone for this uh, British Yemeni Society event, um, in which Gabriel Lavin is going to explore and very excitingly play for us some examples of music from the late colonial period in Aden. Uh, at British Yemeni Society, we got to know Gabriel because he successfully won the British Yemeni Society scholarship last year, which enabled him to do research uh, on this subject in the British Library in, in London. Uh, and in doing so, he uncovered some fascinating and lesser known aspects of Aden's rich history. Uh, Gabriel is a musician and a scholar currently working on a PhD at the University of California, Los Angeles in the Department of Ethnomusicology. He's researching the radio and music industry in the Arabian Peninsula during the early 20th century. He's interested in how media technologies facilitated global cultural exchange while shaping the modern poetic and musical traditions of the region. His appreciation for Yemeni music was sparked after living for extended periods studying music in Amman and Kuwait uh, but sadly, visits to Yemen proved impossible during this recent time. Uh, so just about Aden. Aden was a cosmopolitan Indian Ocean port during the 30s and 60s, uh, the period that Gabriel will be talking about. Until 1937, Aden was governed as part of British India out of Bombay, now Mumbai, so it had strong India connections. Uh, and Aden became a massively busy and important international port. It rose to become the largest bunkering port in the world, aside from New York, and to handling 5,000 ships a year, over twice the marine traffic of Singapore. In time, Aden acquired large communities of Somalis, Indians, and other Arabs. While history often focuses on the decisions of leaders and governing classes, Gabriel will explore a very different perspective the musical interests and tastes of ordinary, ordinary Aidenese. His research also looks into ways that music was at the center of debates about national identity and culture in Aden during this time. So Gabriel's gonna talk for around 45, 50 minutes, uh, illustrated by this wide range of recordings he's put together for us, for which we're very grateful. We'll then have 20, 25 minutes for Q&A, and that will be managed by Daha Kazim, uh, British Yemeni Society Vice Chairman and a founder of the Liverpool Arab Arts Festival, which in their own words and appropriately aims to create a dynamic between traditional and contemporary Arab art forms. So please register as we go along your questions in the Q&A box, Q box at the bottom. Um, and we'll aim to finish the evening around between somewhere between 7.45 and 8. So thank you very much. And over to you, Gabriel. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, James. And thank you, Tahir and Ibrahim, for helping set this up. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Ahren wa sahren fikum um, So I think so when we talk about record industry in Aden during the late colonial period, uh, which James uh, thankfully really gave a nice outline of Aden's kind of place during this time globally and sort of locally in the region. Um, when we talk about record industry, you know, it's, I guess it's important to start by answering, well, what technology are we talking about? What's media technology we're talking about? We talk about commercial music in Aden during the late colonial period. And that is the gramophone, uh, which was uh, invented by a, a German American or German immigrant to the United States, Emil Berliner in the 1890s. Um, and this was a technology that was really the precursor to what we, you know, what later came out in the later 20th century, the vinyl record, and then later the CD. Um, so it's really the beginning, it's a technology that's really the beginning of uh, our modern notion of popular kind of commercial music and selling lots of records. It was a technology that was really easy to produce, mass produce music on, on you know, on a huge scale, on a factory level scale, and then make, then from that create mass markets all over the globe. Um, so in Yemen, as in the Gulf, other parts of the Middle East, uh, like the rest of the world, the gramophone is really defining the development of commercial music from the early 1900s to the to the 1960s. And that's around when vinyl started to sort of replace this older technology. So there's a picture of a gramophone uh, down there, bottom right hand corner of my screen. Uh, 
with a, with a disc, a gramophone disc sitting on top of it. Uh, and I think there's many sort of characteristics of technology. I'd be happy to answer what I can in the Q&A if there's any questions about that. But I think one of the most important things is to note is that this did not require electricity. Uh, there was electric powered gramophones, but most of them uh, that were manufactured around the world were, were operated by a hand crank. So this is kind of an important point because you could have many parts of the globe that were not connected to an electric grid, but were in fact connected and plugged into a sort of record industry and record consumers because you could take this technology on a boat, go out to sea with it, you could take it into the mountains, you could take it on a picnic, you could take it anywhere and listen it to your favorite artists or whoever the records you bought at the store at the time. So by the late 1930s in Aden, they are, are uh, three different record labels in operation. One of them is a branch of the international German Odeon firm, which was owned by a, uh, an Adani merchant, uh, Hussein Asafi, um, and who actually happened to have a brother who owned another record label, which was actually its own locally owned sort of record company in, in Aden called Aden Crown Record. Uh, and it actually contracted with a, an English factory in, in Newbald in the DECA plant to produce its records. Uh, and then the third company that was active in Aden by the late 1930s was Jafferphone Company, uh, which, which contracted with factories both in Syria and in England as well uh, to produce its records. So basically how this worked was that uh, these companies would record a master recording in Aden at a recording studio in Aden, send that master to a record factory in Germany or in England or in Syria, get them mass produced at that factory. Those all those hundreds or thousands of records would be sent back to Aden, which and then would be sold on the market to local Adenese, Yemenis, uh, but also to a much wider audience, as I'll hopefully explore here. The importance of Aden is not only to the history of music in Yemen, but also to the region and even to the Indian Ocean region is very important. Aden had a very kind of like the economies and the ships flowing through Aden at the time, as James sort of outlined. The music is, lots of music is sort of coming in and out of Aden and having a regional influence, not only just in Yemen, but the Arabian Peninsula, even in Somalia and, and other places kind of around the Indian Ocean region. So I'll kind of get into the, to my material now here. So just kind of talking about uh, Sonani music in, in Aden during this time. So uh, a really important study of Yemeni music, a modern study of Yemeni music, is Muhammad Abdul Ghanim's uh, sung poetry of Sana. And so Muhammad Abdul Ghanim is one of the most important sort of scholars of modern Yemeni music. And this book, when it came out in the 70s, was one of the most comprehensive uh, studies of, of, of an Arab musical tradition of any in, in the Arab world. It was really just a comprehensive historical and kind of ethnographic study. Um, and the reason he did this is because uh, even before unification in 1990, Muhammad Abdul Ghanim was really kind of advocating for sort of a culture unification of all Yemenis kind of around the flag of Sanani song and poetry. But he himself was a, a very important Adani intellectual poet, musician, author. I mean, he was just at the forefront of Adani culture during the late colonial period, you know, before he published this book later in the 70s. Um, and in this book, he, he really tried to note Aden's historical important role for keeping Sanani music alive. Uh, so even though it's in the South, it was this cosmopolitan port in the South, Aden you know, really kept Sanani music alive. And he says this was because of the activities of the record companies in Aden at the time. And for families from the North that had settled in the South and in Aden. So like the Almas family, uh, Ibrahim and his father, Muhammad, uh, from what I, if I remember correctly, they migrated and settled in Aden. They migrated from Kokaban during the early 20th century and settled in Aden. And an important reason why Aden was a kind of like a center of Sanani music at the time is because many of these musicians that came from the North were not able to practice this music in the North in the conservative imamate. So they were able to play this music in the South and record it for record companies and, and, and thus popularize it and make it, you know, uh, and have it stay alive kind of during this time. Uh, so this is, so I'll just play this first example of Sonani music in, in recorded in Aden during the late 1930s by Ibrahim al Mas. <laughs> Can everybody hear this? Can I just get a... Can I get a thumbs up that we can hear yeah. this? We can, we can hear uh, Gabriel. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
كان القلب نازيا عن حب زيد الغواني در الممسم ومن له عيان تسبينا سواقيها عن حب زيد الغواني در الممسم ومن له عيان تسبينا سواقيها مورد الخد اياك الرش الاحوم من للحلاوة السحافة صار حاوية Okay, so just quickly moving through the examples here. So as, as James was saying, uh, Aden was uh, technically kind of an extension of British India, kind of on the Indian Ocean. And so that definitely, as far as talking about record, media industry and record industry and sort of commercial sort of culture, that, that really had an influence on Adani music in the late colonial period. So, you know, just on a broader kind of speaking economic and uh, trade level, level of that as the, the Kawashi Dinshan brothers, firm and that was a huge kind of shipping and commercial firm in Aden. Uh, and that's just kind of one example. I just threw this in your, yeah, just probably one example of that. Uh, and, and, and music as well. A lot of Indian expats moving to Aden to, to participate in the, to work in the colonial administration, work in the police force, work in the army, uh, and work in the trade sector. Uh, and so th that brought a lot of Indian music, music from all over India through the Indian migration. So instruments like the harmonium, which is the at the at the bottom right, the gentleman that kind of box, kind of keyboard box, and then also Western instruments like the clarinet, which the gentleman next to him is playing, or or more kind of well-known Indian instruments like the tam tampura, tampura, I think that ta tam, uh, tambour, I think that is. Um, uh, so again, here's another picture. This is from Bilal Vulam uh, Hussein's recent book about. Aden and Aden's history, sort of, so he includes a section about the Jamat groups, the, all these Indian groups that were called Jamat that would kind of gather and have jam sessions in Aden. Um, and he also notes that these eventually mixed with sort of Arab musicians. Uh, so you kind of eventually had this sort of blend of Indian and Arab musical styles happen in Aden with the different groups mixing not only musical elements of Arab and Indian traditions, but also the instrumentation. So this is an example of Ali Sagaf's group or Sagaf. His, his group um, that, you know, you can see in the picture the uh, Arabic oud and then the harmonium, a gentleman in the middle playing the Indian harmonium. And even behind them, there's a gentleman standing playing the maracas, which is a Latin American instrument common in Latin music salsa. So that's also kind of an interesting component. We'll talk about kind of the global Latin American music uh, in, in the South kind of music scene at the time. But uh, so here's a recording by uh, the South Arabia Records that was, it's really a good example of this kind of uh, um, kind of Indian Arab musical blend. And it's the singers, Ahmed Juma Khan, who actually had a brother who was, was much, it went on to be much more famous than him. Uh, we'll talk about him towards the end of the presentation. But uh, so Ahmed Juma Khan, he plays the harmonium, the Indian harmonium in this uh, recording. And he's accompanied by Indian tabla, a percussion instrument. But there's, but then he's singing a classical Arabic poem by uh, Bahadin Zuhair, who I believe also was, lived, you know, was active in the Middle Ages. So here's an example of that. <laughs> So another really important kind of influence that was sort of coming from the opening of aid into Indian markets and media industries was the film business. Um, so uh, this is a picture of advertisements for one of the Aden cinemas. So in Aden by the late 1930s, there's 
no less than five movie theaters, all owned by either Indian business owners or local Adanese. Uh, and these are theaters that are there for the local populace. So uh, quite a quite a large number of theaters in Aden. Sometimes they would do sort of shows for like the officers, like the British officer station there. But most mostly they were, from what I understand, they were, from my research, I understand they were um, for the local populace. And so one of the firms that owned, the Adani firms that owned two of these theaters was Syed Jafar and Brothers firm, uh, local Adanis, um, who would import a lot of these Indian music, or excuse me, Indian films from Bombay through the Sri Ranjit Movie Tone Company. Uh, but this, the but the Syed, but the Jafar firm, or the Syed Jafar and Brothers firm also had the Jafar phone record label. That was another one of their big time uh, media kind of pursuits uh, or, or commercial pursuits was the record, having a record label. So here you can really see there's a connection between sort of the film kind of business in Aden and the record industry business. And um, so it's these, these film firms that are these movie theater companies that are importing the films from India. And then also kind of producing this music that some of this music that has sort of Indian influences. Um, and then also the, the, the Asafi brothers who owned the Aiden Crown and Odeon uh, record labels and branches in Aiden, they also owned a movie theater. So it's, it was a very kind of direct connection between those two things. Um, and this was really influential to, to add the new music at the time because a lot of musicians in Aiden would just take a, a, a melody from an Indian film that they would see in the theater and then just write Arabic lyrics to it or take an existing Arabic poem and just put it to those, to that music that they would get from the film. And this was so common that even intellectuals like Muhammad Ali Luqman started to criticize this uh, because they you know, felt that it, this foreign Indian influence was just becoming too much and that uh, Adani musicians should just start focusing on creating their own music and a type of music that's more locally based in the traditions, in the local music traditions. Uh, so Muhammad Ali Luqman kind of wrote this piece in the Fatat al-Jazeera paper, the earliest Adani newspaper. He wrote this article in the early 1940s kind of talking about this, so saying that he wished Adani music kind of had more national character to it. And one of the films, Indian films, he kind of pointed to that people were stealing music from and sort of writing Arabic poetry for it was this film, Adunya Divani, which came out in 1942 or 1943 in India and was obviously shown in Aden probably shortly after that. Um, and even the decade after that, uh, you had to, the musicians and intellectuals uh, like the renowned uh, Muhammad Morshid Naji uh, making similar criticism about Adani music, kind of saying it lacks its own sort of local authentic character, uh, that there's, that Adani musicians are kind of playing too much Indian music or Egyptian music or even Kuwaiti music. So Muhammad Morshid Naji also pointed to this Indian influence uh, in this book. And he even called it a part of sort of Indian colonization. That's kind of a term he uses in the book. Um, but he wasn't calling to kind of exclude Indian music. He was just kind of wishing that, from my sense of the reading, is that he was wishing that people would just focus on creating a more kind of authentic sort of local style of music to play instead of playing foreign styles of music. Um, so one of the musicians that he pointed to that was particularly influenced by Indian field music was this, this uh, gentleman, Ahmed Abid Qatavi, uh, who is a very active recording artist and musician in Aden during this time. Uh, and so this is an example of kind of one of his sort of ad adaptations of music from an Indian film, but, sung, but singing Arabic poetry to that. So on a record company, Taha film that came out later in the 40s and 50s.
أين المطافي وأين الذي أين المطافي وأين الذي يجير وأين وأين المفر يجير وأين وأين المفر محب الوفاء وحبيب الغيار ودهر تعدى So another style of music that was, had a lot of influence that was sort of seen as being sort of a foreign influence, especially by Muhammad Morshid Naji, or folks like him kind of writing and sort of critiquing music in the 1950s was Kuwaiti music. Uh, there was a very strong kind of presence, you know, in the regional record industry of Kuwaiti, Kuwaiti records kind of flooding the market. And a lot of these, it's important to point out that a lot of these Kuwaiti records actually used poetry that was kind of originally composed by Yemeni ar po poets. So. Uh, it's just kind of, I just wanted to point that out. So that's probably one of the reasons why this Kuwaiti music had such popularity in, in greater Yemen at the time, because it kind of was a lot of the poetry and music of it kind of was based in things that were originally sort of came from Yemen. But in any case, uh, the sort of modern Kuwaiti music at the time was another sort of foreign influence that uh, Muhammad Morshid Naji kind of pointed to and that Ahmed Abid Qatabi, in addition to being very influenced by Indian music, was also very influenced by this sort of Kuwaiti genre called salt, uh, which I'll just play a brief example of right now. And this is Ahmed Abid Khatabi's kind of interpretation of that Kuwaiti genre. <laughs> things that uh, intellectuals and musicians like Muhammad Moshid Naji would do uh, or did to sort of kind of try to make a more sort of authentically sort of local Adani music styles. They, they created the uh, the Adani Music Club or Nedwa uh, al al Adaniya, which also included uh, Muhammad Abdul Ghanim, uh, and as well as I believe the, the, the renowned kind of Adani oud player and singer uh, Khalil, uh, Muhammad Khalil, uh, at the time. And so the effort of this club was to kind of, in the face of all this sort of foreign influence, all, I think they would, none of the members of this group would deny that the, all the Indian and Kuwaiti music and Egyptian music coming through and it was all great music. I think they just were trying to try to, to make like something more locally produced and something more, uh, you know, something more definitively Adani and local. Uh, so that's one of the things that this club tried to do and, you know, through writing songs and music. And they also established sort of a, a record label attached with this club called Kayafon to sort of try to put this music on the market and make it more well known. So here's an example of the, the Adani Music Club, a song written by them. Oh. 
اخوانات كافون ندوة الموسيقى العدنية So it's a very interesting recording because you could tell they still have influence, have many different influences, but they're trying to make something sort of authentic and local, but they still even are using the clarinet in this recording, which is an instrument obviously introduced from India to Aden, as well as the you know more traditional Arabic instruments, the Aoud and percussion. Um, so it's a very, very interesting and lovely recording. So kind of moving on, uh, to talk about another really important musical movement that was a part of connected to sort of the development of Adani recording industry during the late colonial period is, is Lahji music or Lahgi music, um, which was a, a, a style really uh, kind of sort of pioneered by this, this a well-known poet and, and, and composer, uh, lyricist uh, named Ahmed Fadl Al Abdili, uh, who had a nickname uh, Al Gumandan or which I've been told it comes from the English word, the commander, because he was a prince of the uh, Al Abdili ruling family in the Lahaj province, just outside of Aden. Uh, and so many early recording artists beginning in the 1930s in Aden would, 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 would sing his poems and songs composed by him. And one of them, a well-known uh, musician who would do that was Fadl Muhammad al Lahgi. Um, so, and of course, Al Gumandan, who I'll just refer to him as Gumandan from here on that. His, his, his brother, Abdul Karim Fadl Abdili, was the Sultan of, of Lahaj at this time. And, was, and so, of course, within the history of, of colonization from British India in the South, uh, the Lahaji Sultanate had a very kind of important position in this. There was sort of agreement between the British, or, you know, Brit the British Indian officials that, you know, while they would have the Aden colony, sort of the the Lahji sultans the, and the Abdili family would kind of rule the interior you know, region, the, the province surrounding Aden. Um, so, so Al Gumandan kind of connected with his, I think he kind of used his sort of influence as an aristocratic family to kind of part to, to sort of spread like the earliest form of popular music in the, in the South, which was this Lahji music. Uh, in the late 1930s, right around when all these records were coming out, uh, they also produced like a song book, like a lyric book that also had some short stories, but a lot of these songs that people would be hearing in the records that they would be buying at the stores or they would hear their friends play or, or hear at parties or at different gatherings or, you know, in the diwans or, or wherever people were gathering. Um, and so even Adani intellectuals like Muhammad Ali Luqman really liked this movement and they thought it was like a really good kind of locally grown kind of real musical movement, you know, that, uh, you know, while Aden kind of had all this in influence from Kuwait and India, Egypt, the Lahji musical movement was really kind of an authentic local movement they could be proud of. And it was also kind of a part of, uh, you know, a, a popular style of music that kind of circled around this sort of the Lahji uh, royal family, and especially El Gumandan, uh, Prince El Gumandan. Um, even to the point where he was really defending as because as the commu commercial industry in Aden took off you know a lot of people would come out and say you know music is haram music is forbidden in the context of Islamic law uh Gumandan published a pamphlet you know really kind of rejecting that idea and using his own sort of scholarly knowledge and his, his knowledge of you know the Islamic sciences as uh to, to to refute that notion that music is forbidden 
in the, by the laws of Islam. So he published this pamphlet, you know. So he was, in, it was very much in his interest to keep you know, the musical arts and his musical movement alive and going. So here's one example of Lahji music, uh, early Lahji music produced in the late 1930s uh, by uh, f uh, recording by Fadl Muhammad al Lahji, but singing a famous poem by Al Mumandan, um, which I roughly translate to as The Eyes of a Beautiful Woman Pierced My Heart. أديون الأستاذ فضل محمد الله فات عيون المعا قلب ابن صاحب المحبة وبعد ساهر أسير محبة ساحج دمبة قهري على ذن سهم قلبة وزيطار لبة هايم قفا الزين شفا باحا واسد وشاني هايم So and this is, I just wanted to show this here. I probably don't have time to play it because I have so many other musical examples to play, but this is an example of a, a later rendition of this song, I believe from the eighties or the nineties uh, by a very important uh, uh, musician and singer from Lahag region, uh, Faisal Alawi. Uh, and so he recorded this, the same song by El Gumandan. Uh, he recorded it later in Kuwait uh, for a, a Kuwaiti record company, Romco. Uh, and so this is just kind of one example of how sort of this music in the South and, the, and especially whether it was from Lahaj or other regions that was recorded in Aden was sort of exported to the Gulf and kind of played a very important role. And so sort of the beginning of popular Gulf music and as well as musicians like Faisal Alawi that would went to the Gulf to record this, this music and whether it was Lahki music or Hadrami music or Adani music and, and, and really played a, a big part of the beginning of Kind of modern popular golf music in the during the mid 20th century after the colonial period so it's just something i wanted to point out um so of course uh like i said earlier many there's many public intellectuals and musicians in the south that are kind of saying that lahagi music is a very good it's the real stuff it's like the real authentic music of the south and the aden you know versus all the the Kuwaiti and Indian and Egyptian music coming in. And so even Muhammad Ali Luqman, when he criticized sort of musicians taking songs from Indian films, he sort of compared that to the Lahji music uh, of Al Gumandan, which he thought was a much more kind of uh, fruitful starting point for creating kind of a musical identity in Aden and the South. Um, but again, I, 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 some, I just kind of to put this section in here, which is a very interesting part of uh, this history. Uh, while many people kind of thought that Lahgi music was, was the, you know, like a, the authentic locally born stuff, which in many ways it was, music in the South was still very influenced by outside, uh, in, you know, influences, and particularly by uh, Yemeni diasporas living overseas, uh, and particularly the Hadrami diaspora in Indonesia. Um, so there was this a very famous musician who, who grew up in a was one of was from one of the very uh, illustrious Hadrami families that settled in Java, in, in Southeast Asia, during the early twentieth century. His name was Sheikh Al Bar, so he grew up in Java, um, going to I, I believe one of the Irshad sort of reformist schools there. But he eventually became a very famous musician. Uh, and Indonesia at the time, of course, is similar to Aden. It's this, it's a very you know a, a country sort of dotted by important port cities uh, that are kind of exposed to global markets and regional markets. So uh, that was reflected the music, you know, jazz, American jazz, Chinese music, uh, 
Indian music, music from Egypt is kind of all being sort of consumed and sort of listened to and, and redigested in, into modern Indonesian music. And Sheikh Elbar is very much a part of that, but he kind of adds this Hadrami element to it. So he's often considered kind of a modernizer of Hadrami music. Um, but he also would play like during the 1930s, this was the time of like global rumba craze. So rumba is a genre of music from the Caribbean that kind of got cycled into a, American commercial music and then re-exported throughout the world through kind of American commercial music. So then you, during the 1930s, you see rumba music popping up in Taiwan and in, um, in India and in Indonesia, of course, in East Africa, Egypt. I mean, it's just a global phenomenon and Sheikh Elbad kind of was a part of this global rumba movement, but he would combine it kind of with the Hydrami sort of Yemeni kind of influences uh, or, or other Middle Eastern influences because of his upbringing and um, I, well I'm, I'm still trying to research more on Sheikh Abad but it's from what I've read that he actually never set foot in Yemen he actually spent all his life in in Indonesia but but he had contact with poets from Yemen or from Hyderabad and other other places from the region uh, but anyways here's an example of a rumba recording by Sheikh Abad and this was recorded for a Chinese-owned record company in Surabaya, um, in the, in, I believe in the late 1930s. So I think it's, it's also, I should mention too, that the, that the famous colonial uh, officer and, uh, and uh, orientalist uh, R.B. Sargent uh, in his book, Prose and Poetry of Hydramaut noted that, that these recordings by Sheikh Abar all produced in the Dutch East Indies or in Indonesia at the time were widely consumed back in, throughout Southern Yemen uh, during, during the 1930s, 40s and 50s. Uh, and he noted that in his book and sort of predicted that Sheikh Elbar would have a very big influence on the kind of development of modern music, not only in Hyderabad, but in the South and including places like Aden. Um, so, uh, and also, to, so not only were his Sheikh Elbar's records widely consumed back in Southern Yemen at the time, but also he had contact with poets like Saleh uh, bin Ali al Hamid, who, who, who traveled who would travel to Java uh, in, in, the, in the 1930s. And he wrote a book about his travels there and includes some photos of him hanging out with Sheikh Elbar. Um, I'm not sure if Sheikh Elbar ended up singing any, any of Ali, Saleh Ali al Hamid's poems, but anyway, it's, this is an example of this sort of connection, musical connections between the sa Southern Yemen, Hyderabad Aden, and, uh, and, and Hyderami diaspora musicians in, in Indonesia at the time. Um, but then to kind of bring this back to, the conversation about lehgi music is that the rumba was even, uh, uh, you know, because of the musicians like Sheikh Elbar, rumba music and that, that rumba rhythm and genre was started to influence the development of genres like the lehgi music or hadrami music, uh, to the point where even in a re-release of uh, Al Gumandan's book, the lehgi songs, uh, the uh, Abdurrahman people like Abdurrahman Jorjara, who was a famous. Uh, 
author and intellectual from the South uh, is, is invoking the rumba kind of as this metaphor for musical and social prog progress that he believes that Al Gumandan's music uh, kind of embodies. Uh, so that's kind of an example of you know, how this rumba movement kind of influenced uh, music and development of music in Southern Yemen and also went on to influence popular golf music. The, the rumba rhythm in gol popular golf music is like a very, uh, you know, defining rhythm of popular Khaliji music today. Um, so I'm starting to run low on time, but maybe I'll just quick play this recording. So, this, so Sheikh Al-Bar's recordings were later purchased by Eidrus Hamid, uh, who owned South Arabia Records, another Adani record company. And the rights of those recordings were purchased from Indonesia then for, for reprinting on South Arabia records later, I believe in the 1950s. So here's Sheikh al -Bar. This is originally a recording, one of the Indonesian recordings, but re-released on South Arabia records. And this is more of a Hydromi genre uh, called Sharah, uh, performed by Sheikh al -Bar and his, his band. <laughs> So just kind of a fun note uh, I'd like to throw in um, that while, while Sheikh Al-Bar was very important to kind of the development of modern Hadrami music, but also modern kind of music in Indonesia, because as we could see, he would also play modern genres like the rumba or even the foxtrot, so kind of these American jazz genres. So while he's, Sheikh Al-Bar was very important to you know, modern Hadrami music and modern Indonesian music, his son, Ahmed Al-Bar, actually went on to become a... Uh, uh, a well-known rock and roll pioneer in Indonesia uh, with a, ba a rock band he formed called God Bless. And they actually opened for the, the British uh, rock and roll band Deep Purple later in the late 1970s. So I think this is just interesting to throw in just because it's kind of a fun side note, but also to think that the legacy of Yemeni musicians and Yemeni music, it, it, not only does it have influence and importance outside of the borders of modern day Yemen, but maybe also outside of the borders of kind of what we commonly consider Yemeni culture. So it's just kind of a fun aside. But I think I'm talking about the Albar family and Hydromaut in Indonesia. I think it's probably time to turn to Hydromaut itself and kind of the importance of Hydromaut in the development of kind of popular music in the South and sort of record industry in Aden. So of course, Mukalla and Shehar are very important coastal kind of musical centers that produce a lot of well known musicians and poets throughout this time period and until this day. Um, and of course, the coastal regions of, of, of Hydromaut during the, the colonial period until 1967 are, are sort of kind of indirectly ruled through the, the Nizam of Hyderabad. Um, uh, I, this is a history I'll just kind of very briefly go through. Many of you are probably familiar with it. Um, but sort of this, but again, so it's like Aden is sort of a part of British India, sort of the Gaiti Sultanate is sort of a part of the Nizam of Hyderabad. So there's kind of these two sort of parallel connections with India happening between Aden and Hyderabad. And an interesting sort of musical result of this is a, a really one of the most famous singers, one of my favorite uh, singers, uh, Muhammad Jamal Khan, um, who grew up in Mukalla and whose father was a Pun from the Punjab originally. It was a military conscript during the, the, the Gaiti and Kathiri wars in the 19th century. But he settled in Hyderabad, married a woman from Wadi Daun and then the family eventually settled in Mukalla, and that's where Muhammad Jamal Khan and his brothers grew up. We heard a, one of the first recordings we heard was of his, I believe, his younger brother playing the harmonium. Um, so Muhammad Jamal Khan is also a musician, was also a musician. He played in the 
the, the, the Gaiti Sultanate military bands. And from what I've, the many biographies, I've few biographies I've read about him, he played in this band until 1936 when uh, Sultan Saleh el Gaiti took power and sort of started initiating a lot of modernizing reforms. One of them, which was to bring modern military bands in from India, from the Nizam of Hyderabad, uh, and replace the former band, to, which from what I read, many of the members could not read read, read music, including Muhammad Jamal Khan. So all the old band members were fired as the new kind of Indian recruits were brought in who could read modern music notation. But Muhammad Jamal Khan after that went on to have a very prolific music career, uh, recording countless re records in Aden, but also in Kuwait. Uh, and then he also was traveled widely throughout the Arabian Peninsula and, and also he traveled to East Africa. So he's just, because of all his recording activities and his travels, he's probably one of the most influential mus musicians to, to regional music, not only in Yemen, but also in the Gulf and perhaps elsewhere. Um, this is a famous photo of him in, I, I believe in uh, Indonesia or in uh, Addis Ababa in Ethiopia during his travels there. Here's a picture of his younger brother, Abdul Qadir Jamal Khan, who, who also served in the Gaiti Sultanate military bands and, and, and clearly uh, combined those influences in his music. As you can see this picture, they've, he's, uh, Abdul Qadir is on the ode, but then he has clarinets and trumpets sort of accompanying him. So another interesting example of this musical mixing. Uh, so I'll, I'll play a record, one of Muhammad Jamal Khan's recording of what I, from my understanding is sort of an example of modern Hadrami music because it's a kind of a collaboration he did uh, or, or the poem that he sung is, is by uh, 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 an individual named Haddad bin Hassan al-Kaf who was from Tarim, the famous city Tarim in the interior of Hyderabad and was an Islamic scholar, you know, jurist, uh, but also a musician and he wrote music and composed poems. Um, so, and Muhammad Jamal Khan, this is an example of, of Muhammad Jamal Khan playing one of these poems. Leonard Jaffer Fon, Mr. Hamoud, Hamad Jumah Khan. So we have, don't have too much time left, but I would have liked to play more Muhammad Jamal Khan, but I'll just briefly cover uh, one of the other things Muhammad Jamal Khan would do is would, would take uh, like a genre of traditional sort of Hadri music and sort of apply it to his sort of band format and then record it for 
record companies in Aden. So another record company, Azazi Phone. Um, so this is an example of Muhammad Jamal Khan playing sharah, uh, the sharah genre, uh, sort of, but for this kind of in this sort of commercial context, or this for this for a record label. Um, and then uh, he he eventually, like I said earlier, he went to Kuwait, uh, and one of the times he went to Kuwait, he I think, believe around 1960, he recorded with a Kuwaiti record company, Bozaid Phone, and so many people in scholars and musicians of Kuwait kind of consider this the beginning of a genre called Adaniyat in Kuwait. And of course, Adaniyat is a word that refers to the city of Aden. Uh, but what I've been told many times that people called this genre Adaniyat, uh, sort of referring to the repertoire of Muhammad Jamal Khan's music because so much of the records exported into the Gulf, even if it was Hadrami music, they were exported by companies existing in Aden. So that's kind of why this genre took on that name Adaniyat even though a lot of the repertoire in Adeniyat is sort of Muhammad Jamal Khan's kind of modern Hadrami music. Um, so I can answer any more questions about that. I'm trying to just go really fast so I can get the last recording. So this is one of Muhammad Jamal Khan's, and that's actually the genre, one of Muhammad Jamal Khan's recordings from Kuwait, and actually the genre on the label sort of says Adeni. Uh, so it's kind of a, this is the beginning of, of that musical movement in Kuwait. And, Muhammad Jamal Khan has left a huge legacy in Kuwait, um, very influential uh, to musicians like Yusuf al Motraf and Rashid Hamili. Even to this day, where you could go into Diwani or Diwan in Kuwait, and you could see like 15 year old kids playing Muhammad Jamal Khan music, learning the ode and learning the different songs. So it's a very interesting kind of history and uh, that's still very much alive uh, today in Kuwait. Uh, so I've, uh, to close out, I'd just play three more kind of miscellaneous recordings that kind of, again, sort of highlight the cosmopolitan music scene of Aden uh, during this time. So of course, like the like expats from, you know, many other regions of the Arab world or from India, there was also many expats uh, from Somalia, many people working as sailors or, or various jobs in, in, in Aden at the time. Uh, and so many to the point where Adani record companies were producing Somali music uh, to cater to Somali audiences. And I believe I even think there was musicians that would travel from Somalia to record for Adani record companies uh, for them, the markets back in Somalia or elsewhere in, in South Arabia. So again, this is a so this is a kind of example of that. I believe this is in a, a, a song in Somali. It's certainly not in Arabic, and the and the music, the melody sounds like musical traditions from East Africa. Uh, but it's again, it's interesting. It sort of also has this element of the Arab and Indian synthesis that sort of Adani, that sort of defined a lot of Adani music with the Indian harmonium and the Arabic oud. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and play this. Uh, if there's any Somali speakers in the audience, that would be lovely to hear some feedback on whether or not this song is actually sung in Somali. Also, Muhammad Abdul Ghanim also noted in his in his book that later, kind of as increasing frustration towards the British colonial rule, kind of was present in, in the South. Uh, Lahji music also started to get more political. So I believe uh, this is a very interesting kind of example of that. I believe and it's a, a song protesting uh, by Salah Zabedi, 
a song protesting the the transfer of uh, sort of the the transfer of uh, from the Indian rupee to the East African shilling during the late 1940s after the Second World War, um, and I I'll need to have help studying the lyrics further with this song, but it, it seems to be kind of a song protesting that process because I can only imagine of a, a place so connected to the Indian economy, even after 1937. Uh, uh, that transferring to a different currency would, would be a very uh, difficult thing. So this is a song kind of, uh, I believe, protesting the transfer away from the Indian rupee to the East African shilling. And so the last example I'll play just to sort of end the presentation um, is a, a, a wedding song sort of sung by a group of women, women that was recorded in Aden during the late 1930s. Uh, and this is an area I, I'm, I'm trying to explore more because uh, I've seen pictures, I've seen many articles online that talk about uh, uh, different uh, women singers active in Aiden during a time, but I still haven't found many recordings of this. So it's something I'd definitely be open to hear suggestions on if anybody in the audience has any or, uh, but anyway, this is something I've found of an interesting example of wedding music sung by a, a, a group of women led by a, some, a, a woman named Um Salem uh, that recorded for the Odeon company in the late 1930s. And so the, the, the genre is called Terheib al so I guess welcoming the, the, the bride. Uh, so we'll play that. That's, that's all I have for today. I, unfortunately, I had to skip a few listening examples, but maybe if there's time, I can play some of those during the Q&A. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, 
for this fascinating, fascinating uh, presentation. Um, before we go through the, uh, there are a number of questions uh, which we are going to go through them. Um, and I hope we will get uh, more questions if people want to ask uh, for the next uh, 25 minutes we have left. There's one, uh, before we start, there is what from hearing you, there is one common theme from the people like Al Murshidi, Muhammad Ali Luqman, you know, who are against uh, something new coming or mixing, either influenced by Indian or influenced by. Egypt, or, I wonder why is that something part of what they think should be only pure? This is art and it's music. I really don't know, especially a person like Muhammad Murshid Nagy, who is a uh, very well known and encourages music, and he was against this is Khaligi, this is Indian, this is should be. Can you? Should uh, further explanation, please, if you can. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. It's something I've thought a lot about too. You know, reading Muhammad Morshid Naji's books and you know, and reading articles by Muhammad Ali Luqman and Fatah Al Jazeera. Um, I think, you know, my sense is that they weren't against. You know, like you said, they they are artists. They're open to music. They they love music and. Uh, at least Muhammad Morshid Naji. I don't know as much about Muhammad Ali Luqman, but um, I, I don't think it was as much they were against these foreign influences. I think it was just more they were worried that that local Adanis didn't have their own identity, mm -hmm. musical identity. They were busy playing Kuwaiti, Egyptian, Indian music, all these other foreign genres, but they were kind of saying, well, what do we have? You know, And I think a lot of that had to do with kind of enlightenment thought, You know, this enlightenment idea that music reflects the, the the progress and the psychology of a nation and the local culture and identity or even the you know the roots and stuff like that and I think from what I understand of Muhammad Ali Luqman he was very much a proponent of this enlightenment thinking so I think that's kind of where they are coming from trying to really while the foreign music is fine yeah yeah they should they should people should also focus on finding a, a their own personal identity that comes is based in the local traditions, that's my sense. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, for example, you know, I was uh, 11 years old when I was in, in Aden, you know, uh, the early 60s. Mm -hmm. Ahmed Ubaid Qatabi, which was one of the um, uh, artists you presented, you know, wherever I go in the afternoon, people will have the Qat, and then they will listen to either Ahmed Ubaid Qatabi or Muhammad Gumma Khan, it was part of that cultural, you know, mm. day in and on, day out. Um, anyway, yeah. even him, he was yeah. criticized of his music. Mm. We have a number of uh, questions. We'll start with, uh, first one is an anonymous uh, question. Is there a record or archives of these productions? How that person can access them? Uh, yeah, so most of the, these recordings I've gotten are from either private archives or my work in, 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 in the United States, archival work in the United States and England. Unfortunately, there, from what I understand, there is, there's not an official sort of public availability for these recordings from any sort of archive. There's, plenty, there's tons on YouTube that sort of individual users will upload on their own. Um, this is actually something I was talking about with Ibrahim yesterday, is how, how can we try to work to make more of this stuff available? I know Jean Lambert and Rafiq al akuri have been involved in sort of the, the digitization project. There's a ton of these old Adani recordings in the, in the Ministry of Culture and Sana, um, which are, for obvious reasons, difficult to access right now. But there was a UNESCO project to try to um, digitize these and, and make them available. But I think that got cut short just by numerous difficulties from, from, from what I understand, talking to people involved in that project. Um, but other than YouTube, unfortunately, I can't recommend any other place. I mean, of course, Qatabi and Muhammad Jamal Khan, Ibrahim Al Mas, like there's so many recordings of these guys on YouTube. Um, but yeah. these specific recordings, I, it's, it's kind of a, a goal I have to try to start something to 
make this stuff more available, whether it's, yeah. so that's, that's, a, that's a, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Gabriel. Uh, there is a question from, a statement, a question from Hamdan the Mag, uh, says that Almas and Al Qatabi have played a major role in recording and preserving the Yemeni traditional music and songs. Uh, but mentioning other local Edeni musical groups is very much appreciated because they were uh, to some extent underrepresented or discussed. Do you think we know all about such musical groups or more research is needed? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I definitely think this, as far as, you know, kind of in the English speaking world, this is an area that definitely needs more kind of acknowledgement. But I think a lot of that involves sort of translating what it, all the work that's been done in Arabic, because for me, for my own research, I found so many sources in Arabic, whether it's books yeah. or, or things available online that isn't necessarily available in English. Um, so, um, yeah, I think I, you know, I, I guess it depends on who you talk to, what is a, a, represented well or underrepresented. But I would say in general, definitely in sort of Western scholarship, Aden is totally, you know, underrepresented, you know, so definitely more research needs to happen. But I think a part of completing that research is acknowledging the research that's been done in Arabic on these topics. Um, but but I, but I, but, uh, but on the point of uh, Qatabi and Ibrahim al Maz. Uh, had to be, he actually also played a lot of Sanani music. He played everything. So I, I wanted to, if I had a longer time, I wanted to play an example of one artist that would play all these diverse styles of music, everything from the Indian style, the Kuwaiti, Sanani, Hadrami. But uh, anyway, next time, next time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this question is from uh, Jean Ola. I understand there used to be a famous music festival in Lahj dedicated to al Qumandan. Mm. I could not find anything written on this. Do you know anything about that? That's, that's actually the first time I've heard about this too. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still learning every day because I'm kind of looking at Yemen and Aden and the South kind of from the outside, kind of looking at out from the outside in from the Gulf where I've done most of my work and lived uh, for a few years. So um, I have not heard of that, but I, you know, I'd encourage if anybody in the audience has any more information to maybe post something in the, the chat box. I wish one day there will be a festival yeah. for these great musicians who have done mm. uh, great music. Mm, yes. uh, and this question is from John Gibb. What a diaspora, the names, the boundaries spell out yet another world. How often do you hear Semarang spoken of against a background of Egyptians rumba. I'm not sure what the question is, but um, there is another, another question from John. Why is this world not better recognized? Who listens to it now? And how better to introduce it to a wider audience? I guess to, to the first question, I maybe you mentioned something about Egyptian rumba. Yeah. Um, uh, there's actually, I, I didn't have time to mention, but there's in Fetat al Jazeera, there was an interesting article about uh, Egyptian music. I'm not, I can't remember who wrote it, uh, but an pub article published in the 1940s, but they were talking about how they really respected composers like Muhammad Abdul Wahab, uh, Egyptian composers active at that time, because they were mixing, well, they called it Western, but it was actually, they were praising Muhammad Abdul Wahab for mixing rumba into his musical style. Of course, the 1930s is also the rumba craze in Egypt. So, so these Adani intellectuals were looking at Egypt and saying, hey, they're doing the rumba too, you know, this is a good. So it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just, you know, musicians like Sheikh al Bar in Southeast Asia that were importing the rumba to Aden. It was also through the Egyptian record industry as well. And also India, you know, India, the rumba was big in India at the time, you know, so. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that I guess I don't, I don't know if that answers that first question, but um, yeah, the second question, yeah, it's uh, you know, I hope, hopefully, uh, you know, and I would love to talk to people, you know, I'm kind of new to this world, you know, as well, but I'd, I'd love to be involved in projects kind of making this 
music more available, uh, especially to audiences in the West, uh, but as well as in the Arab world. Uh, YouTube, there's a wealth of, a wealth, a huge wealth of recordings of music in Yemen, but um, mm -hmm. it'd be nice to get some things more accessible to Western or other audiences, English speaking audiences. Thank you, Gabriel. I think the, this is a, a, a statement or a comment from Nizar Ghanim uh, saying, was well, Somali and Swahili music and dance and instruments part of the Eden melting pot music, musics and folk dance? I don't think that's a, mm -hmm. that's a statement rather than mm -hmm. a question. Yeah. Would, would you agree with that? I, th I think uh, if anyone would know, it would be Nizar Ghanim. I think he uh, <laughs> he would he would have a better better say on that than me. Uh, but hi, hi Nizar, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, and Nizar actually, by the way, he's working on a book now of of you know kind of this history of African and, and Yemeni musical connections. It's a book he's writing right now. And I, but I've been me and a group of other scholars have been trying to provide him with resources for that. So he's in Khartoum right now. Yeah. So uh, we, we wish him the best of luck with that. We hope to see something soon. I hope to see him soon. Yeah. 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 Uh, this question is from uh, Jean Oler again. Last question, is poetry al Qumandan still available or reprinted? Uh, yes, I believe you can find online. I believe, I don't know if it's archive.org, but you can, you can down, there's a lot of online resources for this. Actually, yes, his um, his book, the reissue, it's called Master al Mufid, Fi Rena Lahaj al Jadid, or something like this. Right. You can you can you can find that on Wiki Source actually. So it's the complete right. thing. So I think if you just do some googling, so many people have posted so many valuable resources online. Um, right. It just requires you know, maybe ten minutes. Sometimes even just one hit, you can get it. But if 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 you want, I can post that on the. the that's chat you, box or... Yeah, you mentioned something, probably this is we underuse, which is the YouTube. You said there is quite a lot you can mm -hmm. find in there. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a mm -hmm. source. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you, Gabriel. This is uh, John Gibb again. What remains today from all this meeting of musical and poetic styles? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. I think I think there's a, a lot of it. I think some of it has probably been, you know, forgotten or lost, but a lot of it is still very much alive from what I see. Even uh, musicians currently based in the north of, of Yemen, you know, uh, Hussein Moheb or Hamoud Simma, they, you know, they're specialists in al ghana Sanani or Sanani song, but they also play Lahagi music, they play Hadrami music, they play a lot of different difference yeah. of these styles and especially in, in the Gulf too this music is so popular I mean Gumandan is you know a, still a very well-known poet you know especially for fans of this music you know Muhammad Jamal Khan and sort of music of the south the Jawsat in the Gulf I mean it's very at least yeah. in Kuwait I've spent the most time in Kuwait uh, you know hanging out with people that play this music I mean it's very active and alive um, yeah uh, and and also Yemeni musicians like Abu Khawaja, uh, people like that. I mean, very, very active in keeping uh, a lot of this sort of legacy alive. But, but there is small things, you know, like the, the the poem about the shilling. You know, of course, that's probably not sung that much anymore because it doesn't. It's not as relevant, but it, nonetheless, it's a very interesting historical moment. That it is. It is. Yeah. Uh, when I when I was listening, I was, I was really. Um, it is funny, but uh, serious. It reminds me of what's happening to the real today, you know, so. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Uh, anyway, um, uh, this question is from Hala al Sadi. Can you elaborate more on which way Adani and Lahji music influenced the first beats of the music scene in the Gulf? Yes, yeah, so that's a really great question it's something i'm still kind of trying to work through the specific of specifics of more but um so basically a lot of the the, the rhythms uh that you see kind of developed in southern music in south of south yemeni music particularly in lahag and uh aden 
you know, through through the kind of the records being sold in the Gulf, because the, these mu these records that were produced in Aden weren't were not only just for people living in the South or the North; they were produced for people living in Somalia, exported to markets in the Gulf. So it was kind of a regional market. Um, so a lot of people would listen to these recordings and then play them and try to adapt them to their own style. But then, in, in, as as things started to get more difficult and rough and war and the sort of resistance to British colonialism happened in the 60s, you know, that led to lots of migration. Of course, the oil industry was taking off in the Gulf. So a lot of people migrated, including a lot of musicians. I even found in Kuwait, uh, Mohammed Morshid Naji was registered in sort of like a Kuwaiti sort of music club, you know, in the, by the early 70s, because he would travel there a lot. Faisal Alawi, these yeah. guys would travel a lot and do concerts there. And, um, and again, I'm more familiar with Kuwait, not as much the other Gulf countries, but Kuwait was sort of the center of, you know, in the 70s and 80s was the center of kind of, it was sort of like what Dubai is now in Abu Dhabi. It was like the commercial center producing a lot of the popular music. But the Yemenis that migrated there, as well as people from other regions in the southern, you know, in the south, Oman, Abu Dhabi, UAE, you know, they played a big role in kind of passing these music traditions to the Gulf. And then kind of development from there. Hopefully that answers the, the questions. Yeah, well, thank you. We have uh, probably um, just a couple of minutes to take uh, two more questions. This one is from Rana Jarhu. Thank you for this wonder snapshot of Adeni music history and for the music samples. Yes, please, if there is time, could you play extract from Muhammad Jum'a Khan uh, Sharh and Adaniyat songs. Uh, I would love to hear that as well. Of course, I'll have to share my screen again here. <laughs> Yeah, I, I couldn't, I can't just only play one minute of Muhammad Jumah Khan's songs. I have to let at least two minutes go, but here we can play this one. So this is the Sharah. Qanat Azazifun, Mutrub al-Mukalla, Al-Ustad Muhammad Jumah Khan. Sotaka Abu Abdul Aziz.
This is great. Um, it was a great uh, finishing. There are so many questions, Gabriel, just to let you know. Okay. Just is just immense and I'm, I'm really, really pleased. I think maybe uh, the last uh, question very quickly, could you recommend any CDs of the Hadrami music available <laughs> in the UK? Um, I, 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 I don't know, unfortunately, I don't know if, they, if there are CDs available in the UK. Um, I, would, I would suggest maybe contacting Paul Smith he might have a better idea. He's a member of the British Yemeni Society and has done yes. many re recording projects in, in, yeah. in Yemen and, and East Africa and elsewhere. He's yeah. organized festival, helps organize festivals. And, um, but I would say, um, you know, if you have access to, to YouTube, this is, this, is the best, this is the best place um, for, for Hadrami music, for all, you know, even, you know, you search any, even Shara, if you want to see some modern Shara, uh, just type that in and you get hundreds of videos of people filming their own sort of parties or their own gatherings and it's, it's amazing even some more professional kind of setups where they're sort of filming the traditional setting with a really nice beautiful background with the traditional carpets and things I mean really really great yeah. stuff on YouTube if you can access that yeah okay great uh, for those that we were unable to answer your questions uh, I'm really really sorry because of the time um, could you please, um, uh, and you would like to hear from Gabriel, please email us to events, E-V-E-N-T-S, at b-ys.org.uk, which is the British Yemeni Society uh, email address. Please do so, and we will work out with Gabriel to answer your questions. Very, very sorry about that. Now I will hand um, the last uh, word to James, who is the chair of the British Humanist Society. James, over to you. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Tahar. Yeah, thank you, Tahar. And uh, thank you so much, Gabriel, for giving us such an interesting evening. Um, really, it's just amazing to hear all those, those voices and sounds from, uh, from the past in our own homes and, and see the incredible diversity. Um, I think, you know, one question that really has come up is how better to introduce this music to a, to a wider audience and a Western audience, um, particularly perhaps at this time. And um, we must give some thought to, to that and uh, discuss that with, with Taha and, uh, and the rest of the committee. Um, so look, many thanks, uh, Gabriel, for, for taking us that you know, amazing tour de force it's been instructive, but also really good fun, <laughs> usually enjoyable. Um, mm. And frankly, we need more evenings like this when uh, mm. Yemen is going through such a, a difficult time at war. Um, finally, I would like to just unashamedly put in a quick plug for British Yemeni Society. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. But we are an organisation that uh, runs on people's own time. Uh, and we can only put on events like this if we... Uh, thanks to our membership and, and people paying a small membership fee. So I do really hope that um, you might be interested in joining. You can join through the BYS web, uh, website. It should be reasonably easy. Um, we're putting on other events uh, next year, including a debate about Yemen's economy, uh, a historical event looking at Yemen and earlier pre-Ottoman and Ottoman periods. And we've revamped our journals so that it should be uh, it's larger and uh, covering a, a much wider range of, of topics, and that will be due out later this month. So, uh, yes, please join up if you, if you feel able. Don't, don't be put off by the fact that we're the British Yemeni Society, because we have a large international contingent as well. So, just remains me to finally thank Gabrielle, and thank you all for attending, and uh, uh, have a good, very good evening or afternoon or wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, James. Thanks, Bar.